WIC, good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Um, could you, uh, can we get the house lights up, please, and uh, a little bit? And could you just greet those around you? Say hello. Smile and say, I'm happy to be in the house of the Lord today. We are the, um, we are the Wesley International Congregation of Wesley Mission. Um, of the Uniting Church, and our vision and our mission is transforms lives, transforming cities. So do we have anybody visiting with us today, or new, or, um, yeah, somebody who's, have we got some people here? If you want to, if you feel comfortable, can you put up your hand so we can welcome you? Um, and if not, we want to say welcome. Please join us for tea after the service. Make yourself known. It is so good to have you worshiping with us today. And, um, and we, we pray that you're going to be blessed. Uh, it is the first Sunday of the month. And what we do on the first Sunday of the month is we share together. We obey the command that Jesus actually gave his first disciples. And we share in communion together. Now, if, uh, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, he came, he came to give us life and he came to give us salvation. And that's what we're remembering in this as we, as we partake of this meal, um, if he's not yet, if he's not that yet, that's you, I want to encourage you to be really seeking him. You might want to just not partake today, um, or you might give your heart to him in this moment. Um, but for the rest, the, for, for, for those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, this is a very special moment. It's a moment that um, Jesus shared with his first disciples over 2,000 years before, to over 2,000 years ago. It was a moment that he said to them, remember this moment and do this in remembrance of me. It's a moment when we remember that Jesus went to that cross so that we could be sitting in this place today, so that we could become children of God. He went to that cross so that our sins could be washed away and that we could be come, that we could come into his family. And so now I'm, I'm glad to hear that we've all done the ripping. Let us remember that night, that night before Jesus went to the cross, the night that he shared his last Passover meal with his disciples, the night where he was betrayed by one of his own, the night that Satan actually entered that person. And Satan thought he was going to have the victory. But he wasn't because of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. They were having that Passover feast. And during that time, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God the Father, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. After supper, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink this cup from this cup, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Friends, when we eat the bread, the wafer that you have in your hand, when we drink from the cup that is in your hand, we remember what Jesus did for us. We remember that he went to the cross to pay for our sins. To enable us to receive forgiveness from God so that we can stand before him unashamed and unjudged. But he also went there to destroy the devil's work in our lives, to give us victory over the enemy. That's what he did on the cross. Our Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you left the glories of heaven for us that you made a way. We thank you, Lord, that today we rem- we're remembering that. We thank you that we walk in your power and in your glory. And we thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is in us and around us all the time. We pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would come on us and upon these gifts in greater power and greater measure, so that we, we may be filled as we take, take these gifts and remember what Jesus has done for us and be able to walk, walk forward in full confidence 
declaring, I am a child of God. I am no longer a slave. I am a child of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's um, eat out the bread together, the wafers that you have, and remember that Jesus' body was broken so that you could have life eternal. And let us drink from the cup, remembering that Jesus' blood was shed on that cross so that we could receive forgiveness for sins. Let us pray. Now, Lord God, we want to thank you so much for all your good gifts to us, but mostly we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you fed us in this feast and reminded us of the eternal banquet in your presence where there will be no more tears, no more heartache, no more suffering, no more conflict, no more war, but just beautiful peace, your shining face, and a place where you will be worshipped and adored. Amen. Amen. Thank you, the ushers are coming around to tell us to finish. So... Alrighty, so um, we've got a few announcements as we start. Um, for those of you, um, will we do the BFF thing later? Oh, let's let's do this. We'll do BFF. Okay. Um, our superintendent writes puts a lot of effort into writing a, a short email every week. Um, and if you would like to receive that to, to hear what's going on in the mission, what's on his heart, what's happening, um, please. Uh, use your phone and you can get that QR code, you can sign up and that will come to you once a week. So I want to encourage you in that. It's just a good way to keep in touch with the broader mission because we are part of a, of a bigger mission. So thank you. Johnny, can I get the next slide? Um, yeah, men. Um, Friday the 25th of August is a men's dinner. Next week we'll have a code for you to be able to register so we know how many we're catering for. But really want to encourage you um, come into the service. Um, it will be Dick JC that night. So Dick JC is get your dads to drop you in and then you can get your dads to take you home and, and have some fellowship here. Um, it's probably going to be food like that. So if that's going to encourage you, come on in. Uh, pizza. Um, also, um, we're, as Andy will be sharing, we're entering our season on spiritual warfare and deliverance. There's going to be a spiritual warfare and deliverance workshop on Saturday the 2nd of September here from 9.30 to 4.30 um, in the pseudo room at level, on level 3. Just want to want to remind you to put that in your diaries. Um, it's going to be showing, you know, we can only do so much in sermons. This is going to show you practically how to get free. Practically how to walk in victory. Right? Going to give you some very practical tools, a much deeper understanding of what's potentially causing some of the issues in your life. Um, so, yeah, um, next week, so just book that date, and it shouldn't be, oh, the RSVP is 25th of August, it's on the 2nd of September, okay? So put that in your diaries. Next week, we'll have a QR code for you to register. And um, we are now, uh, uh, do we have some members who are part of BSF? Some of our members go to BSF. It's an amazing, amazing program where you can get um, to know Jesus more deeply. And I don't know if you know, but there is there is a BSF meeting here once a week on a Tuesday night, and we're going to watch a quick little video on that. Alrighty, I highly recommend that. That's on level three. I just I now want to um, welcome Andy up. Um, and uh, yeah, just want to thank you. Thanks. 
Morning, church. Great to see you guys. I'm going to invite Trudy to come and join me now. Um, now, as some of you would know that Trudy has been um, just such a wonderful part of our team uh, here at Wesley International. Uh, she spent many years serving uh, as our administrative just our organizer of things generally. <laughs> just, just so many different things that, that Trudy did. Uh, and um, uh, we did share a little bit with the church a, li a little bit earlier in the year that um, Trudy got a different job and moved on to a different role, but is still part of this community in WIC. Uh, but we haven't had a chance yet to actually pray for her and thank her publicly. Uh, in fact, um, there was a day that we had flowers organized and then she got sick, so we had to deliver the flowers but that's why there's no flowers today, in case some of you are thinking, why are there no flowers? Um, so, um, yeah, Trudy, we just want to say as a church that um, we're so grateful for all the prayers, all the organizing, all the different things, the blood, sweat, and tears that you've put into um, helping us. Uh, there are so many ways that Trudy has been helping behind the scenes. Some of you who've been part of this community and the organizing, you've experienced that. So who's been blessed by Trudy's ministry? Just, just give a wave or a shout if you have, yeah? <laughs> As you can see, Trudy, Trudy's quite shy. Um, but look, we just want to say thank you so much. And um, we're really grateful, you know, that, uh, that we've been able to share in that time together. But we're also excited about this next journey that God has you on. Um, you know, and yeah, I, yeah we, we'll, we'll, we want to pray for you now and, and send you into this next phase um, with faith and, and encouragement. And just to let you know too, um, yeah, you will st still see Trudy around, but this is partly thanking her, this is partly encouraging her for the future, but this is also partly don't ask her to do stuff, <laughs> okay, in case you're wondering, right, oh, Trudy, where's this, where's that? Um, there is someone who stepped into that role, her name's Carmen, and we'll share a bit more about her a bit later, uh, but, um, but yeah, for now, let's join our hearts, let's pray for Trudy. God, we want to thank you so much. For Trudy, our sister in Christ, we thank you first and foremost for who she is and um, the way in which you have shone your light through her life in the most gentle, humble, servant-hearted ways, the way that you've expressed compassion and love through her, the way that you've blessed this community through her life. And we want to thank you for the seeds that she's sown and watered over these years. And we pray, God, that as she's already stepped into this new role, Lord God, that you would bless her, that you would encourage her. Uh, thank you that you have your hand upon her, that you would lead her, that she will be a blessing in this uh, new workplace. And we're so grateful, Lord God, uh, that we get to still be blessed to, to spend time together with her as a sister in Christ in this community. But bless her, bless Peter, bless Tim. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Bless you, Hips Trudy. Can we give her another hand, guys? Yeah, so, so good. She is such a blessing to me. I was <laughs> devastated when she left, but it's great to still have you here, Trudy. Um, we're now going to uh, take up our offerings as part of our worship um, as we um, acknowledge that God is our provider, um, that he is the one who gives us our gifts. And, you know, the thing about giving to God is that it all gets sewn back in so that others might come to know him. So some of you give online and there's, there's a QR code there. Some of you prefer to give uh, physically. Um, we're going to take that up now. Um, but as we uh, take it up, we, for those of you who give online, we'll just, bring, just see yourself bringing that offering before the Lord and let's, let's dedicate it to him. Our loving God, we want to thank you for all your good gifts to us and we thank you for our work. We thank you for your provision. We thank you um, for your love and we thank you Lord that you're the God who says that you will never leave or forsake us and you will give us what we need when we need it and so Lord we come to you now as an act of worship and an act of praise and honor and we bring just a small part of what you've given to us and we pray Lord that you would be sowing it in to the work done here in, in WIC to the work, work done amongst our missionaries the work done in the city um, and may many, may, may much fruit be born from uh, this giving. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, I'd love to invite Michelle, who's going to come and bring our Bible reading for us. Okay. Michelle? 
Schau mal jetzt rein. Okay, I'm not seeing Michelle. That's okay. I will do the Bible reading. So today's Bible reading comes from Revelation 12, verses uh, 1 to 9. Uh, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with a moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Yeah, some of you are giggling because yeah, I've got some props here that we're going to be using for today. And uh, that sometimes helps us as we unpack the word of God. Was that? Sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm just standing slightly to the side because I think the speaker causes a bit of feedback. But uh, it's great to be with you guys. Uh, happy birthday, Sally, for a recent special birthday. Um, and it's great to have Jim's mum with us today as well. And Darren and Bibi, great to have you around town as well. How long are you guys around for? A month. Okay, got to make sure we catch up. Great to see you guys. Well, um, and Jenny, great to see you too. <laughs> There's just so many faces that I haven't seen for a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, excuse me as I get excited about that. Well, as we come to um, the Word of God today, we're actually starting a new series, and that is on spiritual warfare and deliverance. So that's part of our, our series, which is focusing on freedom this year. Now, why are we talking about spiritual warfare and deliverance? Some of you might hear those words and think, what in the world is that? Or some of you might think, oh, okay, this is going to get a bit kooky, right? But basically, the reason why we are talking about this is because so much of the freedom, so much of the freedom that Jesus brings in the Gospels uh, is, is, is where we see that there's a conflict between Satan and his demons and what it is that Jesus is trying to do in people's lives. And um, you can see Satan and his demons oppressing people, harassing people, uh, he's uh, causing some to be sick. He's causing some to hurt themselves. He's causing others to hurt other people through demons. And uh, you can see Satan is harassing Jesus. He's harassing the disciples, and he's trying to disrupt the plan of God by disrupting the people of God. And so we felt that it was important for us to talk about uh, this year of freedom, to talk about spiritual warfare and deliverance, because there is an aspect of freedom that will only come through understanding these principles. And so the reality is that he is trying to do the same in our lives. He's trying to harass us. He's trying to uh, cause some of us to be sick. He's trying to cause us to harm ourselves. He's trying to fool us and trick us because he's uh, opposed to God and what God wants for your life and my life. And he wants to do anything in his power and ability basically to stuff us around and remove and kill to destroy, take away the good uh, and, and the goodness of God in our lives. So we need to be aware of that. If, if you and I want to be free, if we want to help other people be free, then we need to understand the principles of freedom in the reality of this ongoing battle that's happening in our lives. So let's pray as we come to God's word now. God, we want to thank you that we've had an opportunity to sing 
about you and to sing to you and declare how amazing you are. We want to thank you that we've had the uh, opportunity to, um, yeah, just pray together and call on your name. And we're asking now that as we come to your word, that you would open our eyes so that we might see the reality of what's going on around us spiritually, so that we might be free, and so that we might be able to help others be free as well. Holy Spirit, have your way and move amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church, um, the Bible makes it really clear that there is a battle that is going on. And the verse that was read, or the passage that was read just now by Jean, uh, helps us to understand that. But you look through the scriptures and you will see there's a very clear picture that is being painted of this ongoing battle between God and his angels, and Michael, his angels, and Satan. He is God's plan, and in the center of that plan is his son, Jesus, and the kingdom, and his reign. And at the center of that kingdom plan that God has uh, for, this, for humanity is his people, the church. And as God is unfolding his plan, we see that there's an enemy that comes onto the scene to attack his son and to attack his people. We see that there's a cosmic battle that is going on between uh, God, Michael, and the angels that are underneath his leadership against Satan and his demons that are under his leadership. And at, at the center of that cosmic battle that's going on, we're caught in that, in that crossfire. Because God has chosen to bless us, to give us dominion, to cause grace to be upon our lives. And, and what the enemy wants to do is he wants to break that, steal, destroy, and kill us. And, and to, to break the purpose that God has for our lives. And when you think about this, um, I don't know about you, but I've been following the Ukraine-Russia conflict quite closely ever since it began. And that, real is, that war is very real. There's a battle that's going on. And what they're doing uh, to each other is they're trying to get as much intelligence as possible. Ukraine is trying to find out as much as possible about what Russia is trying to do, where they're trying to do it, where they're deploying troops. They're trying to do as much as they can to get that, what they call that reconnaissance, to understand the enemy. And Russia is trying to do the same. Why? Because when you understand the enemy, you can engage in battle, isn't it? You know, maybe some of you guys have been watching uh, the, the World Cup, the Women's World Cup. Right? And so what coaches will do is they don't just play, but they will also try to understand how does the opponent you know, work? What do they do? What are their weaknesses? Because if we're to overcome the enemy, if we're to overcome our, our rival, we need to understand how the enemy works. And today, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be focusing on understanding how Satan works so that we can not only understand who he is, what his strategies are, but so that we can overcome him through what Jesus has done. That's what today's message is actually going to be about. And some of you would know this already, but uh, according to the scriptures, Satan was once an angel that was given great responsibility. And in his conceit and his pride, he managed to trick a third of the angels to follow after him and oppose God and rebel against God, and they were cast down to the earth. They were given some power and some authority on the earth. Uh, and, and, and he does nothing but cause destruction. Jesus says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is what Satan basically does. Cause destruction. And I want to ask you for a moment, like, have you experienced uh, Satan? Or have you experienced uh, evil spirits or demonic things happening in your life? or in people around you. You know, maybe you've experienced maybe demonic attacks, maybe you've seen people being influenced by demons before, maybe you haven't, I'm not sure, or maybe things have happened to you that you know this is unusual. You know, there's something spiritual going on here and it's not God, but I don't quite know how to put my finger on it. Well, what's your experience been? I know for me, my earliest memory that comes to mind was when I was three years old, and uh, it's 
yeah, one of my earliest memories of Satan. And no one explained to me who he was, but I kept having this recurring dream about him. And I just knew it was him. I, I don't know if that's happened to you before, but they just kept coming. I just knew it was him. There was such a wickedness about him and what he was trying to do to me and my family. As a three-year-old, I didn't understand that, but I knew who he was. How about you? The Bible explains about Satan, about who he is, but the Bible wants us to be alert and aware, not afraid, okay? So what we're going to talk about today is who he is, and we're going to just look at three different aspects of what we see in Revelation 12 uh, in the passage that was read out for us, that he's described as the serpent, the deceiver. He's described as the devil, in essence, the accuser. He's described as Satan, essentially the adversary. And we're going to look at these, uh, you know, when we were talking about as a pastoral team, we didn't want to uh, magnify Satan, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah, come to church and hear a message about Satan. <laughs> but we wanted us to, to, to tackle it so that we can understand who he is for the purpose of overcoming him. Amen? If you have someone in your life that is constantly there trying to hassle you, trying to make you stumble, trying to, trying to stuff your family around and cause you harm, if, if a person was doing that in your life, what would you do? I know some of you might get physical, right? When it comes to your family, you're very protective. Some of you might maybe try to call the cops, right? What would you do, right? The reality is that is what the enemy is doing all the time in our lives. So we want to be aware. So come, let's have a look at this, guys. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Nehemiah when he went to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. And at one point, they were building the walls with one tool in the hand. And what was in the other hand? A sword. That's right. Sometimes in the Christian faith, we just focus on the tool. Yep, I want to be part of building God's kingdom. I want to be part of building people's lives. We just focus on the tool. But in Nehemiah's time, there was an enemy that was trying to stop them from building, rebuilding what God was doing in their life. And so they needed to carry the, so the, the tool in one hand and a sword in the other. And that, I believe, is the balanced Christian life. When we are sowing into building in the kingdom of God, but at the same time, we are able to defend against the enemy and attack when and repel when he comes to harm us and harm the people of God. And so the first one is this, the serpent. Ah, oh, I'm so sorry, but the formatting has taken away the T. Anyway, the serpent. Revelation 12, 9. It describes him as the great dragon. And he has great power and authority over the earth. And he's described as that ancient serpent. So these images of the dragon and the serpent, when you weave them together, you get this image of someone who's very powerful, uh, someone who's cunning, someone who is deadly, constantly deceiving. That is what we see here. And the first time that we see the serpent uh, uh, mentioned in the Bible is actually in Genesis chapter 3. Some of you guys might be familiar with that. What's happened is God has created the world, and he's created humankind, and he's given humankind dominion over the earth. It's a beautiful thing. God keeps saying, it's good, it's good, it's good. It's very good. And up until that point, all that Adam and Eve had experienced is the loving and caring and ge generous heart of God who is walking with them in the cool of the day. It's, it's just so beautiful what's happening in that space. And then the serpent appears. And the serpent comes. He wants to destroy the goodness of what God has prepared. He wants to destroy humanity and pilfer the dominion that God has given to humankind. How does he do it? Two sentences was all it took to wreak his destruction. How deceitful, right? Two sentences, that was it. The first one was this. Did God actually say, he just approaches Eve, he just slithers his way across, and he says, did God actually say you shall not eat any, of any tree in the garden? This is how the, the deceiver works, right? The deceiver distorts God's words. 
If you look at this passage, God never said that. What did God say? He said, you can eat from any tree that's in this garden. Let me put it in perspective. You can sit on any chair in this theater except just this one right here. You can eat of any tree in the garden, just not that one. And so God was trying to give humanity the most simple of choices to obey or disobey. And you can see the generosity of God. Any tree here, just not that one. What does Satan do? He distorts the word of God. And he twists God's word. God never said that. He twists God's word as if to say, wow, you know, did God really say, did God really say this? And you can see when there's a showdown between uh, God and Jesus in the wilderness, in the, in the desert. He tries to use the same tactic. And then Satan directly contradicts what God says. He says, you will not surely die. So he goes from twisting God's word to starting to distort God's image. He says, no, you're not going to die. No, don't be silly. When you eat, your eyes are going to be open, right? You're going to be like God. So he distorts God's word, then he distorts God's image. What he's trying to say is there is something good that you can have in your life. And God, he's not good. He does not want you to have that good thing. See, see how he's really deceiving, right? You know, so, so he says, look, see, this one chair that you can't see, how stingy is God? How stingy is God? How, how dare he? He's not a good God. He won't let you sit in that one chair, which is so good, man. You sit down in it. You, when you sit down in that thing, God knows. You're going to know something. You're going to be like him. And see, instead of focusing on the generosity of God, on his love and his care and his kindness, twist it around. How stingy is God? Really deceiving, isn't he? So cunning. Have you experienced that before? I know I have. Uh, the, the enemy just come and he just twisted it so that all of a sudden I think God is so stingy when the reality is he has blessed us with so many good things. Right? And two sentences, that's all it took. You know, what you can have through disobedience is far better than what you can have by obedience. That's what Satan's trying to say. Two sentences, Adam and Eve fell for it and it was all over. Deceit. The definition of deceit is the practice of tricking someone by concealing or misrepresenting the truth. And that is one of the biggest weapons that the enemy uses to try to fool us. John 8, 44, it says that he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, and listen to this, and the father of lies. This is what Satan does. The serpent. Just tricking, deceiving all the time. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says he has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Just tricking people all the time. Revelation 12 uh, nine says he's the deceiver of the whole world. He leads the world astray by misrepresenting the truth. And someone tell me, what do you think is the best way to overcome deceit? Did someone say something over there? Truth. That is right. Amen. Thanks, Tiff. The best way to overcome deceit is by the truth. And Jesus said, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's right. You know, I think I've shared it a few years back, but what happens is with elephants, what they do in the circus, what they do in the circus is that they will take a baby elephant and they will wrap a rope around 
its legs. And then it will tie it to a stick. Then it'll put that stick in the ground and that poor baby elephant is too weak. It doesn't have the strength to be able to remove that stick, right? But this is what happens next. That elephant grows and becomes stronger. And you know how big they get, right? And as they develop and they grow stronger, they are still underneath the, the trick that they do not have the strength that's needed to pull themselves free from that stick. And so with elephants, even full-grown elephants, they just, just right, put the stick right there. The elephant doesn't realize the truth. What's the truth? That thing could move 20 sticks if it wanted to. That thing could rip off that rope. And the same thing happens to us. We're stuck. We are stuck in the deceit of the enemy. We're stuck in lies that he has fooled us with. But Jesus wants to set us free. Amen. Sorry, did you hear all my scratching just now? <laughs> you did, didn't you? It's the 360 degree experience. You know, similarly, the Emancipation Act in America declared on the 1st of January, 1863, that all slaves were now free. But the sad thing was, there were some slaves that didn't know the truth, that didn't know the news, and they remained in captivity for years, tricked by their masters who were no longer their masters. By law, those masters had no power over them anymore. Why were they still under captivity? Because they did not know the truth. If they know the truth, they will just pull off that rope, throw down that stick, I'm free. In what way is the enemy trying to deceive you and me? And I'm going to be honest here, there's so many times in my life that the enemy has tricked me. He's, he's tricked me about myself. He's tricked me about sin. He's tricked me about my family. He's tricked me about relationships. He's tricked me about troubles that I experienced in my life. Has anyone else experienced the trickery of the devil before? Right? The way that I overcame that, I don't know what it was for you, but the way that I overcame that was when I understood the truth when I came to understand the truth of God's word, the truth about me, the truth about life, the truth about sin, and Jesus was right. The truth set me free. And the reality is that there are constantly things in our lives that the enemy is trying to tie us up in, to fool us into believing, to keep us in activity, to stop us from understanding the emancipation act of the word of God, there are emancipation promises in the Word of God for every situation. The more and more we understand them, the more and more we will be free. Amen. I better put this stick down. It's a bit intimidating here. <laughs> All right. That's the serpent, the deceiver. Next, the devil. Same verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. You can see it. When you translate the word diabolos, it actually means accuser. That's what keeps coming up, accuser. And the Bible says this, he's the accuser of the brothers and sisters, the accuser of, of God's people. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a volunteer here. Can I get a volunteer? Just, don't worry, it'll only be slightly embarrassing. Okay, as, as, as you make your way to the front in faith, <laughs> I'm going to start sharing about a vision. Thanks, Jean. <laughs> oh, you're just repositioning yourself, are you? Okay, yeah, come and join me. Okay, all right, here we go. No, just, just, yeah, just relax. All right. So what happens if we turn to the book of Zechariah, I think this gives us a really good glimpse into, in terms of how the accuser works, okay? So, uh, Zechariah has a vision from God in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. 
And it's a vision of the heavenly court. It's like a heavenly courtroom, okay? And in the place of the defendant is um, Joshua, who's the high priest. And you can see, uh, so, so Jean's going to represent Joshua. Let's start with Jay, okay? Um, and so, so uh, she's in the position of defendant in the courts of God. Should we put this on? That's, oh, do it the other way because it's really gross. But yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so this is my dirty apron from home, okay? So, so this is the problem. Joshua the high priest is standing before the courts of God and before God himself. And the problem is Joshua is absolutely filthy. Like he has these clothes on him that are absolutely disgusting. Interpreters, some interpreters say he's covered in excrement, okay? So he's absolutely filthy. Before God. And then what, ha- and the, the filth and the dirt, the, all the stuff, it represents the sin of Joshua as well as the sins of the people. Okay? Now, what happens next is Satan is at the right hand side of Joshua in the position of prosecutor, accuser. And it says that Satan is there accusing Joshua before God. And we don't know exactly what he's saying, but it's, it's, it's implied that he's probably saying something like this. God, how can you accept Joshua? How can you accept the people? Look at how filthy they are. Look at how sinful they are. Look at all the things that they've done wrong. Look at the way that they, that they uh, rebel against you. They are not worthy of receiving your grace, your kindness, your forgiveness. No. Your Honor, they are not worthy of that. They deserve to be punished. They deserve to suffer. Leave them with me. That's what's going on. A little bit like what happens with Job, right? What, what Satan is trying to do in the courtroom of heaven is he's trying to uh, accuse and prosecute and position himself so that he has a right to be able to take down the people of God and thereby take down the plan of God. So that's, that's what's happening, right? And, and Revelation 12.10, it describes Satan as the accuser of God's people. And it says that he's accusing them. Look at that verse beforehand. When's he accusing them? Day and night. So in other words, he is relentlessly coming before God and saying, look at your people. Look at them. Like not just Joshua the high priest that stands before God like Jean is today. All of us who place our faith and trust in Jesus, are going through this. That's what's actually happening in the spiritual realm. Satan is accusing us before God, pointing out all of our sin and our unworthiness, all the ways that we don't deserve His grace and His mercy and kindness, positioning Himself so that He can get in a place where He can say, give them to me, give them to me. I want to take them down. They don't deserve your grace. Look at how sinful they are. But check this out. Look at how God deals with the accuser. This is beautiful. Seriously, guys. Okay, check it out. Firstly, God himself rebukes Satan. And a rebuke is a sharp reprimand. The Lord rebukes you, Satan. In other words, God is saying, essentially... Shut up, right? That's the translation of the Hebrew and Greek. Shut up. You'll be silenced. Because Jerusalem, I have chosen. I've chosen them. I've rescued them. I've chosen to have mercy on them. That's the first thing that God does. The second thing that he does is he says, take off the filthy clothes. You take them off, that's right. Yeah, I might hold on to that. (laughs) Not as easy as it feels. Eh? That's right. Okay, good. Take it off, right? Take off. Uh, God removes. God removes the sin. God removes the filthy garments off Joshua, uh, and and as he's taking that away, he's taking away the sin of Joshua and the people. That's removed. Look at what God does next. He renews with righteousness. He says, "I will put a new garment on you. I'll put fine garments on you." This is still white, thank God. Hey, there you go. <laughs> it's got Nathaniel's name on it because um, he 
his, his grandma made it for him. It's, it's, you know, it's quite cute. But, but, but yeah, he says, I'm going to put new garments on you, right? So not only does God remove the filthy clothes and the sin and all that kind of gunk, he then redresses us. He renews us. You know, he puts the righteousness of God on us. Zechariah is so excited. He gets in on the action and says, put a turban on his head. I don't know why, but yeah, that's what happens, right? Zechariah's like, oh, this is so cool. Put a turban on his head. And the, the high priest will wear a turban. And on the turban will be written these words, holy to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I, I don't have a turban, so yeah. It's got a white apron. This is fine. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, G. All right. And the next thing he does, he restores Joshua for service. And he says, Joshua, you know, if you're going to walk in my ways, this is what I'm going to do. Gives him a promise. Isn't that beautiful? Now, the reality is that God has done that for all of us through Jesus. What a beautiful Savior, amen? You know, if you look at Hebrews 7.25, you look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, you look at plenty of other scriptures, what God does, Jesus rebukes Satan, and he also gives us the authority to rebuke Satan. You're going to be hearing a lot more about that as we go through this course, and if you come on that that special workshop. You'll be hearing a lot more about that. Then he removes our sins. The Bible explains, right, that he who knew no sin, so Jesus, who essentially was righteous, completely righteous, he who knew no sin became sin. He took this upon himself so that we might become the righteousness of God. So exactly what happened to Joshua is what happens to every believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? Every single one of us. He takes away our filth and all that stuff, right? And he replaces it with the righteousness of God and he sends us out. He says, you go. You be my hands and feet. You be my voice. You be my ambassadors, my ministers of reconciliation to the world. The reality is that... Uh, yeah, you can take a seat now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Give me a hand. Thank you, Gene. I might put that on. This is so exciting. <laughs> you know, the reality is this. This is, this is you. You believer in Jesus. Actually, it's going to get in front of the mic. But okay, this, this is you. Okay. Give me a shout of you believe in Jesus here today. Yeah. This is you. Not this. Okay. And the enemy is trying to say, look at this, look at this. He can't. Because this is gone. This is left. You and I, believers in Jesus, are the righteousness of God. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It cost Jesus everything to make it real for us. But this is the reality. And so when Satan is trying to accuse you, you hear his voice, right? Echoing in your ears. He has no standing. He has no right. In the law courts, the father says, get out of court. Get out of here. What are you doing here? You have no right. Because all I can see is what my son's done. And on top of that, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, interceding, praying for us, pleading for us, advocating for us. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 7. And on top of that, as he does that, he has given us his authority and his power. What a beautiful God. What's the devil accusing you of? Let's get a bit real right now. Well, what do you feel like you're hearing him saying to you? How, how do you feel as if he's, you know, trying to put you down or condemn you in your life? If you're experiencing that in your life right now, or you know someone who is, I think you need to have a chat with God about this. You need to go back to the reality, right, of what Jesus has done through the cross. It's so powerful what he has done. That's why it's so important for us to remember and to understand, to remind ourselves of the power of the cross. What is the devil accusing you of? What is he saying that you are unworthy of? What is he condemning you about? What is he telling you to give up? Romans 8.1, it says there is no condemnation. Everyone say no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And in that same chapter, it says in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? 
Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Verse 33, and listen carefully, guys. Verse 33, who will bring any charge along with, uh, who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? This is courtroom language going on here. No one, because it's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Then verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Somebody tell me. Amen. Amen, Johnny. No one. No one. No one. So when the accuser gets in your ear, you've got to come back to the truth. Don't let him deceive you. You have someone pleading for your case constantly. Praise his name. How beautiful is our Savior. Amen. The last one is this. The adversary. I'm just going to get a tissue. Give me a moment. When you translate Satan, it often comes up with adversary. So one writer said, think of the adversary as the ante. You know, when you think of ante, you put ante in front of anything, and it basically means the opposite of what that is, right? And that is essentially what Satan is. He is the ante. He's the anti-God. He's the anti-insert your name. He's the anti-Andy. He's the anti-humanity right? The Bible explains that, he, as I said before, he's seeking to steal, kill, and destroy us and anything that is good and that is of God. And Jean was sharing a bit about before when we were talking about communion, that the night that Jesus was betrayed, Satan pops up his head, Luke chapter 22. And what Satan, the adversary, loves to use is temptation. That's one of the things that he uses. And it says there that... Uh, uh, the, this is what Satan does. He, he waits for the opportune time. This is how he moves. Oh, uh, maybe don't open that uh, fire exit because I think it might actually, yeah, that, yeah. But we're trying to work out what that blowing sound is from. Is that right? It's okay. Hopefully we can sort that out. But yes, that's another tool that he uses, distraction as well. So anyway. So the adversary, okay, he uses temptation. He looks for an opportune time to be able to attack us when we are weak. And this is the moment that Jesus was about to be betrayed. And it explains that Satan entered Judas, who was one of the 12 disciples. So Judas, a little bit about Judas, he had a, a weak spot for money. John chapter 12 verse 6 explains that he was a thief and he was the keeper of the money bags. That's a really bad combination, isn't it? Yeah? Anyway. So he would often steal money for himself. That's what, that's what Judas would do. He's the tempter. And so how does, you're probably wondering, how does Satan enter into Judas? And can Satan enter into me? Right With Judas, what was happening was, it wasn't like all of a sudden this thing happened. There was a progression in Judas's downfall. There, there, was, there was a continual just opening the door, opening the door through what uh, Judas was doing, and that leaving the door open came to this point where Satan entered into Judas, and Judas went to plot the betrayal of Jesus with the chief priests for, for some money. So that's what he tries to do. Now, if temptation doesn't work, the adversary will use trials. In the same chapter... Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. And so some translations say you. Actually, you is plural. So even though he's talking to, to Simon, he's actually talking to all the disciples. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you all as wheat. Now, what does that mean? Got my little colander here, right? So, so maybe when we think of sifting, 
you know, oh, you know, we're making like a flourless chocolate cake and it's really relaxing, you know, like sifting and this rhythmic motion relaxes me. You know, that's not what's going, what's going on here in Luke chapter 22, okay? So the better way to translate that is a violent, all right, a violent shaking so that you'll fall. That's what's going on here. So Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to violently shake you so that you will fall. That's what's going on. And so he knows, Satan knows that if he puts enough pressure, if he puts enough trials and difficulties, if there's enough trouble, enough challenge and and the things that are going on, that maybe, just maybe, the disciples are going to be unfaithful to Jesus. And look at what happens next. I love this. This is Jesus' strategy for the sifting. Beautiful. He says, but I have prayed for you, Simon. Isn't that beautiful? Like, he could have said, you're going to betray me. You suck, Simon Peter. No. Right? I hope you, you know, like, do all of your full repentance. And then when you get back, I might just accept you. No. He says, Simon, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, when you've retraced your steps, strengthen your brothers. Isn't that beautiful? And you know, Peter's not the only one that Jesus prays for. He's praying for you and me constantly. Wow. Jesus' strategy for the sifting, prayer for perseverance and encouragement. You notice he doesn't just pray. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, Father, would you help Satan's ass to sift, but I'm praying for him. And yeah, you know, you keep keep him so that his faith doesn't fail and doesn't mention anything to his disciples. Right? He could have done that, right? Right? He didn't have to tell the disciples. No, he prays and then he encourages. He prays and then he says, Peter, come on. I prayed for you, buddy. When you return, you strengthen the brothers. You encourage them. I love it that Jesus was an encourager. Maybe you feel like you're being sifted as wheat. You know, throughout the week, as, as a pastoral team, we hear of things that people go through in the church. And sometimes it's so intense. Maybe you feel that you are being violently shaken. Maybe you feel like you are being overwhelmed by trial and trouble and, and persecution or, or some other issue in your life. And maybe you feel like you're pushed to the brink. You don't know if you're going to be able to endure that. I want to encourage you here today. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Why? Jesus is praying for you. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is praying for you with groans that you and I don't even understand. Not only that, your Father loves you and understands what you need. The one who sees one sparrow fall to the ground and he knows it and who loves you and knows what you're going through. And on top of that, you know what? We want to pray for you too, right? As the family of God, we want to come alongside you and what you're going through. We want to encourage you. And on top of all those things, he's given you and I the powerful word of God that is filled with the fullness of promises of hope, promises of God's power and his presence in your life and my life. Please don't give up. You feel like you're in the middle of this right now. Don't give up. Hold on. God will make a way. I'm not saying everything's going to work out, but God will make a way. I'm not saying it's going to turn to the way that you want it to turn to, but he will move. He will reveal his presence. He will reveal his power. Persevere. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And that is the truth. Praise God. Jesus. He is the truth that sets us free from the deceiver. Amen. And he is the defense attorney that defends us against the accuser, as well as the one that has stood the trial for us, as well as the judge 
who acquits us, right? Praise God. And praise God that he's our prayer partner and encourager against the adversary who has won the victory. If you are here today and you're not yet a believer in Jesus, please. You know, without Jesus, it's a one-sided battle. I tell you that, that is the truth. I know that firsthand. If you do not yet know Jesus, open your heart to him. Turn towards him. Repent of your sin. Confess before him. The moment that you repent of your sin, the moment that you place your trust in Jesus, he takes this and basically chucks it in the fire. Right? And he gives this to you and me. That's what he wants to do. So give your heart to Jesus, church, if you're not yet a believer. And for everyone else, I want to encourage us. Right? We know a bit more about how the enemy works now. Yeah? He's the deceiver. He's the accuser. He's the adversary. But we also know a little bit about how we overcome him. And at the end of the day, it's Jesus. Right? And so this is the soul training for this week. Where is the enemy trying to deceive you, accuse you, tempt or trouble you? Um, in enemy terms, there's something called recon. Recon, which is short for reconnaissance. That's when you go out, you send some people out, maybe you get on a plane, and you try to find out where the enemy is at work so that you can work out where to deploy and engage in the battle yourself. I want to encourage us to do that this week, to actually take some time to pray about and think about where is the enemy trying to accuse you? How is he trying to deceive you and me? Where is he tempting us? You know, where is he trying to cause trials or troubles in our life? And just get that down on a piece of paper. Maybe talk to someone about it. And I want to encourage you to actually, let's together, let's come to the Word of God and allow the Word of God, the truth of God, to shine a light into Satan's shadows in our life. Amen? To actually combat what the enemy is trying to do in our life through the Word of God and through prayer. And I want to encourage us to do that together as a church. Find someone that you can pray with and that you can encourage together to overcome the enemy. Does this sound all right, church? Yeah? So are you willing to give this a try this week? Give me a hand if you're willing to give this a try. Do some recon this week against the enemy. Yeah, there's a few people. Anyone else here? Okay, yeah, I want to encourage you to do that. Let's take this seriously. Again, if there was a person that was doing this in real life, in your life, you would not let us lie. There's someone more powerful than a human being that is doing this in our life. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to let that happen anymore. We don't want to let that happen to one another. So let's engage in battle, amen? And praise God that the victory has already been won. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join us now. And um, I want to encourage us as we sing this song to come before God with a heart of surrender, to come before Him with a heart that is just wanting to trust Jesus. To trust Jesus with this battle. And maybe as you sing these songs, as you sing these words, there might be things that start coming to mind, maybe ways in which the enemy is trying to hurt you or hurt the people around you, ways in which he's trying to tempt you or discourage you, ways that he's accusing you that come up. If those things come up, just bring them straight to God. Just lift them up to him. Declare the victory that he's won on the cross. Declare what he has done through the beautiful exchange, through his forgiveness. That's the power of repentance and confession. So you can remain seated as we sing this song, but let's sing this before him. This is an invitation to come to Jesus and to call upon his name and to trust in what he has done. And after that, we're going to pray a little bit more before we close our service.